And now, from the Academic Agency. It is a lost start. I'll vouch for that. No one expected the return of the Debenhams voucher. Sure, I would say. Sure, 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 sure. And so. I think we've reached peak wank. Think. Think this advice. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, this is a little bonus stream that um, I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to be talking for about. Uh, there's a guy in the chat, Cron. You think it's it's lame, do you, mate? Banned. Banned. You made the fatal mistake, Cron. Of, uh, you know, if I spot you in the chat, it's usually a banning. All right. So, you know, that'll uh, that'll teach you, innit? Bugger off. Go and watch Tim Pool. Go and watch somebody else. I don't give a shit. Uh, there, there's no, I have no um, tolerance left for anybody anymore. Zero, like, nothing. Uh, I just... Uh, cannot stand any any sort of uh uh you know irritation so so just don't bother all right so today um what we're going to be doing is uh we're going to be having a look at um uh all of the shows recently that there have been on the conflict in the middle east between obviously uh israel and palestine or as it's being called, uh, the Israel-Hamas war. And um, I basically have spent, since this started, um, I have curiously basically lost all motivation to do anything apart from uh, listen to streams analyzing this conflict and kind of play video games in the background. And that's basically all I've been doing. Um, obviously, I've been doing my usual, you know, uh, father duties, taking AAA out, and, you know, uh, seeing the missus and all the rest of it. But, um, you know, in terms of actually doing any work, it's been very difficult for me to get motivated. Um, I'm just kind of like addicted to listening to analysis of this war, which is especially curious uh, given my stance or on the conflict is to remain neutral um, and almost to watch it in the spirit of watching a, watching a kind of, you know, sporting event or something like that, uh, popcorn in hand, um, which, yes, I realise people's lives are at stake, but it's happening a long, long way away. And I am, uh, you know, a, a, a cynical postmodern man um, and, uh, you know, I need to get my kicks somehow. So... Uh, I do it by watching World War Three unravel. So, um, yeah, I've been really interested in um, the way this has been shaking out. Uh, also, it's kind of um, an interestingly kind of clarifying little moment where uh, people kind of um, 
nail their colours to the mast. Um, and uh, we will be going into that in, in, in a moment. But um, I would want to say on a personal level, it's kind of just destroyed. I wouldn't say it's destroyed my life, but I just can't do anything. Any spare moment I've got, I just want to listen to analysis and watch what's going on. Um, and I've had this a few other times where I've just been like hooked on the news cycle. Happened um, around the time of the election cycle, happened around the time of BLM. It's kind of like, uh, kind of, and you, you just end up kind of just doing nothing else. Um, and I'm sure that it's not good for one's kind of health, mental health, well being, or anything else. Um, yeah, I'm kind of just like in a perpetual haze. I'm not sure if I've slept for weeks now i have i mean i obviously have slept but it's like it doesn't matter because the first i'm just looking to get my next hook and um my, my next fix you know and um one of the uh one of the th things um <clears throat> one of the things that happened to me last night is that i actually finally reached the end of all analysis it's like i have listened to every stream there is about this and I was like, I need something. Where am I going to get it? Like, and I was, I was begging around. I was like watching CNN. I was like, where am I going to get? It? I was like, like bits of Al Jazeera. You know, oh, this is not good enough. Where am I going to get my next fix? And uh, I had, um, I had, uh, <laughs> I had, uh, yeah, like literally every stream, every stream there is. Um, and uh, <laughs> and um, I was saved. When Pete Quinones, uh, Pete Quinones, uh, uploaded a show with uh, a guy called Lucas Gage, <laughs> I was like, "Yes, I've got something <laughs> that'll keep me going till four a.m." <laughs> and then, you know, I was up. Uh, you know, something usually wakes me up early in the morning. Well, I say early, like nine or ten o'clock in the lodge. An acorn falls on the roof. I was like, "Oh shit!" I've been woken up after only having, you know, five hours sleep or whatever. And then immediately back on, oh, has anybody uploaded anything? So, you know, this is pretty bad. It's like being hooked on drugs or something. I don't know what, I don't know what else, um, I don't know what else to do, but I can't, honestly, I can't think, I can't do anything. I can't write, I can't. Like I thought about like making a few normal videos or anything, and I just can't do anything. It's just kind of uh, knocked me out a little bit. Um, so I wanted to get this out of my system. Uh, yeah, I've been do I've been doom watching and doom scrolling and like just I don't know. I've just kind of like it's it's been weird because you're kind of watching this terrible situation unfurl. But also you're kind of binge watching it like you're watching an old box set or something. This is like my box set now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's weird. Uh, anyway. Um, um, and then the, 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 on, a key, on a few occasions, I've tried to, like, pull myself out of it by, like, oh, Chandler Bing has died. Remember Friends? Let's talk about that. No, I can't. All I care about, all I think, all I can think about is... You know the situation in the Middle East, so there we are. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll set up. A, you know, like they do Alcoholics Anonymous. Maybe I'll set up my own like AA, like uh, I don't know what you'd call it, like a kind of uh, news current conflict news cycle binge watchers uh, addiction club or something. Um, so um, so anyway, anyway. Uh, Let's uh, get on with it then. I did make um, for my sins a political compass of uh, the various positions that uh, you may find on uh, on things. Uh, I haven't thought too much about this. There are probably other positions, but generally speaking, in terms of all of the streams I'm going to look at, all of the shows out there, there are, I mean, there's the all-out Zio shill. That's the Ben Shapiro, the kind of like, I am balls to the wall shilling for Israel, right? And that's my whole thing. And there are a few of those. Um, and 
I mean, to, just to explain, the all out, um, the all out Zio Shill is uh, somebody who um, basically takes their talking points directly from the Netanyahu government. You know, there's like an official line. There's an official um, Israel set of talking points from that government, and um, you know. There's the version of it that comes from Israel itself, and then there's the neocon version of it on this side, where they talk a bit more about Iran and stuff like that. But um, you know, and I've seen some pretty insane things out of those people um, over the past few weeks. I'm not going to lie, including a claim that somebody was putting on Twitter. I mean, I can't even tell what's what is somebody taking the piss and somebody genuinely meaning it anymore. Uh, when it comes to this, because there was one of these characters on Twitter who was claiming that um, they are basically like baking children in ovens. That's what that's why he was claiming. And he was freaking out and saying, oh, this is what they're doing. Um, so, yeah, there's the uh, the all out Zio show. Um, and th I, I suppose there's a, there's also the think of the children. Think of the poor Palestinian children who are getting there kind of houses bombed and so on. Um, but of course, these two positions, the all-out Zio shell and the think of the children, are not uh, mutually exclusive. You you can kind of find people who are, broadly speaking, pro, pro Zionist, but are still like, yeah, we shouldn't kill children, though, you know. So there's not many of them, but there are a few of them around, I've seen. Um, then there is the all-out anti-Zionist. Um, I mean, that guy who was on with Pete Conones was a pretty good example because uh, straight up he just said, I'm not pro-Palestinian, I'm just anti-Zionist. That's my whole thing. Like, my thing is I'm against Israel. <laughs> um, and I was, it was kind of refreshing to hear how kind of blunt he was about it. But, um, yeah, so there are those people as well. Then uh, there's our old friend, the Counter Jihad. I've been seeing plenty of that doing the rounds. Um, that is your little kind of center right containment trap there where, you know, you, you don't really have to come out and say that you support Israel, but you do have a problem with there being lots of Muslims in, in your own country type thing. Um, and, you know, focus on that basically. So, and then um, I put in the middle there, the take that, uh, you know, the official line that we had on uh, unpopular opinions and that I've been encouraging people to take is that literally, you know, your own position on this should be that you care for your own for your own people. Um, so don't get sucked into the propaganda on either side. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, you shouldn't be up for your governments funding any of this any of this stuff uh, whatsoever. Um, I'll say that after listening to many, 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 many hours of content. Um, I've probably been sliding down this line a little bit. Um, I'm probably more, I'm probably more anti-Zionist than I was this time three weeks ago, um, due to the sheer amount of stuff that I've learned from all of the many streams. Um, I've definitely shifted further down this way. Um, I have not really moved on this line at all. Again, Whenever I see, um, I mean, I do realize that people are being killed in this conflict um, in 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 Gaza, and that's a humanitarian crisis and all the rest of it. But um, I've just always been immune to think of the children type stuff. Maybe I maybe it's because I just don't have a heart or something. I just don't care. I, I just honestly, I've never cared about that. Um, and you won't be able to make me care with you know, posters of, uh, you know, boys crying wrapped in the Palestinian flag and all of that. I mean, that stuff is for women. Uh, doesn't, it doesn't, I don't feel anything when, um, when I see that sort of stuff. And then on the other side, uh, you know, I've talked about counter jihad before, but uh, this time it's particularly galling, of course, because of all the reasons we pointed out already. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not like my response really to a lot of the scenes in London has not really been 
oh, isn't it? I don't really feel anything when I see. I already knew that there were lots of people in London who aren't who aren't British, essentially. Um, so my response has not been emotional. It's more been kind of faint amusement at seeing the um, exact people who have argued for this stuff. What like watch it blow up in their faces, essentially. And um, you know, I've been signal boosting. I, a lot of friends of ours have been pointing out their hypocrisy, of course, and I've been signal boosting a bit of that. And um, you know, essentially. Um, highlighting the fact that, you know, this was obvious to all of us many years ago. Uh, why do you only care now? Um, and, of course, we all know the reason why they only care now, of course. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's basically all the different positions. So with that said, let's uh, start on the tier list. I hope this will be a vaguely entertaining uh, afternoon stream for everybody. I've got my cup of tea here. And uh, here's all of the different uh, shows I, I've been listening to. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll make a we'll make a start. Um, uh, all right, so where should we start? So believe it or not, there's this channel with about two point three million viewers called Democracy Now, which is a, obviously a very left leaning channel, and they have very left-leaning guests on, or far-left guests. Uh, they also had on Judith Butler, the uh, the, fe the famous feminist. And uh, I mean, the, you've got to understand how how um, how deep my addiction is. I was out of everything, so I was listening to Democracy Now. I was listening to like essentially like far-leftist programming. Um, because it was the only thing that I hadn't already kind of consumed. And uh, to be honest, I thought that Judith Butler gave some pretty good points on this show. And um, one of the things that interests me is that clearly there's a propaganda war going on. And Democracy Now! is a, sh is a channel that, you know, when you watch a video on YouTube and it automatically, it, it auto plays the next video. Like if you if you're watching this channel, I can guarantee you, at the end of this stream, it will automatically flick to um, uncommon. Un it, hey, I'm Peter Robinson. It's uncommon knowledge with my distinguished guest, Professor Thomas Sowell. Um, it will either be that, or it will be a Jordan Peterson lecture from about six years ago. That's what you know. My channel, for some reason, has it in the algo that. If you watch this, the next video will be Thomas Sowell on Uncommon Knowledge or Jordan Peterson. Um, Democracy Now! Um, is basically been auto... Every, any video I've watched on Israel over, over the past week has basically auto-flicked onto this channel called Democracy Now! Um, and as you can imagine, they're extremely pro-Palestine. Um, where's my political compass again? On this compass, um, on Democracy Now, they're here. They're bottom left. They're anti-Zionist, and they think of they're very think of the children on there. Okay. Um, it's been kind of interesting watching that because one thing is clear to me is that um, the Israelis have completely lost the left on this issue, and they ha they haven't just lost kind of fringe elements of the left. They have lost the major kind of thinkers and voices of the left, like Judith Butler. Judith Butler is not some like just some professor. She is like the major gender theorist of the past 30 years. I was made to do Judith Butler when I was in university, as I'm sure you were. Uh, and Judith Butler is Jewish, of course. Uh, she's still at the University of uh, California in Berkeley there, which is, a, you know, one of the major left-wing centers in America. Um, Judith Butler is not going to get fired. Spoilers, friends. It doesn't matter how anti-Israel she gets, she is not getting fired. Um, the left will cancel people who are against Judith Butler. They will not, they're not going to cancel Judith Butler for Israel. Okay? This, this thing is a fact. Um, 
So anyway, in terms of the tier rankings, Democracy Now! and their coverage, right? Democracy Now! as, uh, I mean, of course you wouldn't do Judith Butler. She looks like a man. Uh, and of course she proudly looks like a, she, she, she proudly isn't kind of non-gendered. That's her whole thing, right? Um, so uh, anyway, yeah. I mean, I don't particularly rate Judith Butler as a, as a theorist as a, you know, on gender. However, the point she makes in this video about what's the situation, what's happening um, in the conflict between Israel and Palestine, um, and specifically her focus on the linguistics games, the linguistic dehumanizing language games played by the Israeli government um, as being essentially genocidal, um, as essentially codifying Palestinians as non-human, I think is actually a very interesting little bit of analysis. Um, I also think that the, I mean, Judith Butler is not the only one I've watched of Democracy Now. Um, generally, they've had quite intelligent content on there. So even though it is far left and pro-Palestinian in orientation, uh, I'm going to put Democracy Now as an A. I think it was really good. I think it's really good. Okay. So... Uh, yeah, I, I even though it's a far left channel and I probably would hate them under normal circumstances, uh, their coverage of this has been a pretty good counterbalance or counteract to a lot of stuff that you see uh, for coming out of the American media in particular and, and kind of right wing Zio Shell outlets. Um, I will say in this country, the media has been a lot more balanced or they tried to be. Uh, BBC, a kind of soft pro-Palestinian, I would say. Sky News, and in fact, a lot of the British media has been more on this end of things. And um, frankly, I think that, um, that that shows that certainly within, on the left, Israel has lost moral legitimacy. And it's going to be very, very hard to recover that. So even if they win this conflict, let's just pretend they wipe out Hamas, as they say they're, they're going to do. Um, I don't know how they win back the the room, if you want to put it that way. The room. Uh, the, I mean, they're pretty much down to boomer Christians in America and kind of boomer right-wingers in this country and boomers in general. Um, but, of course, in terms of social capital and social status, that's the kind of scraping the barrel. That's kind of the, the lowest of the low in the current order. You don't want them. They're rubbish. That's like Donald Trump's crowd. You don't want them. What you what who you want is people like Judith Butler. Who you want are the professors and the intellectuals and the journalists and the opinion makers and the um you know humanitarian organizations and the and the United Nations. But they've lost all of those. So it it I really do wonder how Israel as a brand and Israel as a kind of uh, as a thing that people can kind of openly support is going to come back from it. I wonder it's going to because their PR has been shockingly awful uh, to the extent where I reckon most people would watch that Judith Butler left or right I'm talking about would watch that Judith Butler video and say. Probably got a point, you know. Got a point. Probably got a point. Anyway, the next person I'm gonna uh, I have here is is that highly respected? I think it's highly respected. That's Scott Greer. Uh, he's done a few streams on this. Um, now, 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 Scott Greer has been um, Scott Greer has been. I mean, he's broadly DR. I would say. In his in his in his takes, but Scott Green is a bit like um, Patrick Casey in a way in which in, in which he sits at a intersection between Washington and or like mainstream politics or what's going on in in Washington and the DR. Uh, I don't quite understand what his deal is, um, but as far as I understand it, that is what. 
Um, that is what he's been doing. Um, and those streams, his streams on Israel, have very quickly gotten into the weeds of American American domestic politics and what's going on kind of um, inside the kind of uh, the, the beltway there. So, yeah, that, that's kind of his focus, um, which is, uh, you know, it's all fine and dandy, but uh, I don't know. I, I didn't remember much uh, from these streams other, other than... Um, Ever than looking at the domestic impact within within American uh, Republican politics and stuff like that, um, he does make some pretty nuanced distinction to, between you know the uh, the DR and Republicans, um, but in general, I'm putting him as a C. Um, the next person here is Vox Day. Now, now this I, I should mention by the way, this is not. A tier ranking of the overall value of any of these channels. This is a tier ranking specifically of their coverage of the Israel Middle East crisis going on right now. Okay. So the next person here I'm going to uh, uh, rank this is Vox Day on his dark stream. Um, and for some reason, uh, uh, for some reason, um, for some reason, Vox has not really been that much on fire on this topic. He's not, he's not provided much insight, really. Um, I get the impression he's not that interested in it, or he's his mind is elsewhere. So, I kind of like Vox most of the time, but on this occasion, he's he's on the he's I put him bottom tier. Um, I didn't use the one with F, but yeah, you know, D is the standing F here. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, he, he's just not, it's not been that great. Um, so let's move on. So then we have, um, maybe I should have had an F tier. Maybe I should, is there possible to add a tier? Can I add a tier? Add row below. Oh, here we are. Oh, here we are, look. F. So I do need a tier below D, I've just realised. Because the next person here is Harry Engladeev, who did a four-hour stream, I listened to about half of it, called Laughing at the Guardian with Some Women, Part 80, Gaza's 80 IQ Military. Uh, this is a straight F, and I'll, let me explain why. Let me explain why, okay? Um, and, uh, let me just, here we go. Right. So now it's all uniform. Um, Harry and Gladeev's, uh, stream here on, uh, you know, basically laughing at Gaza's ATIQ military, I thought was, uh, the, the, the kind of very worst in Tory boy nastiness, you know, he's a Tory boy. He is a, uh, you know, just a coward, basically. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he read this Guardian article where they were kind of like pointing to some of the humanitarian crisis and so on. And his, I mean, I, d I don't know. I just don't understand where somebody like, unless Harry and Gladeev himself is like, you know, both parents come from Tel Aviv or something. And as far as, you know, as far as I know, that is not the case. I just don't understand where he gets off laughing at uh, these people. I just don't get it. Like, I mean, why is he doing that? And I think he's doing it because his kind of spidey senses tell him that power says that it's all right to do that. It's all right now that it's safe because Rishi Sunak has put the Star of David on Downing Street and, you know, you you have a little bit of permission to engage in a bit of kind of low tier bigotry like this. So, ha 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 ha. These people have only been, um, you know, locked in an open air prison for the past thirty years, denied, you know, basic uh, basic things. Um, you know, casually shot once in a while. Um, you know. Uh, they have to kind of endure this the whole lives. And 
your comment, your kind of insight is to make fun of them for being low IQ. I mean, it's just, it's just fucking worthless, isn't it? It's just kind of like all you can say about that is Harry Anglid Eve's not a very nice guy and lacks any sort of kind of understanding of anything. It's just a stupid, it's just, it's just not, I mean, it is kind of just like repellent to me because in normal circumstances, this piece of work, this Harry Anglid Eve, is the sort of person who's on Twitter like calling Morgoth a Nazi or having a go at me or you know I, I you know I, I remember the whole fracker over the um this was many years ago do you remember when those three are uh, three lions do you remember all of that with the england team and they had the three black players and i was like you know how can you why are you cheering this bullshit on when they're taking the knee harry um so he is he is just the absolute worst kind of sniveling worm i hate this guy um, so I had to include a, um, a, t a, t a I had to include a Tory boy because I, I mean it doesn't matter what the issue is they find a way to be the most repulsive people anywhere in the spectrum. Like I, I respect Harry Anglid Eve less than Ben Shapiro on this. At least you can say Ben Shapiro is for his own people. Harryan, nah, he's just sniffing the wind. <laughs> well, what's power doing now? <laughs> Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I support the vaccine. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what's power doing now? Oh, oh, oh yeah, well, yeah. We had. We uh, hate the Russians. Hate the Russians. Me. Oh, what's power doing now? Oh, oh right. Oh yeah. Bloody Muslims. L low high. Ha ha. Palestinians getting killed. Ha ha. You fucking hate him. What a little twat. So yeah, he is like he is the worst of all of these streams I listen to. Harry Angladeev is the absolute rank bottom. Um, so the next um, next person uh, was Countercurrents. This is Greg Johnson and his whole outlet. Um, in fact, there were two videos that Countercurrents put out. Um, and um, <clears throat> um, Greg Johnson, did. A, I think the guy is called Vox Populi, who's... Who, who now? I don't know what's been happening at Countercurrents because I think Greg Johnson's been away because it sounded like he'd been away, and that this guy Vox Populi had been hosting the normal podcast. But Greg Johnson was coming back just to do this stream, and um, uh, Jim Goad also put out a video which was pretty heart hitting. I, I shared it on Twitter, um, and uh, you, you should check that out because it goes through the history of how Israel acquired nuclear weapons. And uh, something called the Samson Option, which is their doctrine, their alleged doctrine. It's never been official. They're, in fact, their nuclear program is not official. Um, and Goad goes into basically how, the, how they acquired this and basically how insane the Samson Option is. Uh, you know, basically just involves dropping nukes on people who were meant to be their allies, you know, European cities and things like that. Um, essentially, if, if they lose any conflict, any military conflict, or if they look like they're going to lose, they'll blow up the whole world, basically, or they'll start like a nu nuclear Armageddon. So that Jim Goad video, I'd say, uh, goes hard. I'm not I'm not always a fan of Jim Goad. He's a bit kind of like um, Gen X Daria on uh, at the best of times, in, in my opinion. Um, and I mean that in a bad way, not a good way. But on this occasion, Jim Goad dropped the hard video on Israel uh, nuclear stuff. Um, the uh, the actual countercurrents podcast with uh, Greg and so on had good information. Um, it was they were kind of interested in. Uh, there was a little moment when Alex Jones started was moaning about like, please let us have our own voice and things like that. And um, the uh, you know that was good. I, I thought Greg had some pretty decent takes uh, overall. He was uh, generally warning people not to get kind of drawn into counter jihad and all of that. So on the whole, I would say Greg Johnson um, and counter currents have had they get an A from me. I don't know why. It, why does it do that? Okay. Well, anyway, they're an A as well. Oh, that was pretty good. PJW, um, he's only really had one actual video on this, and he's kind of been like skirting around it a little bit. We'll kind of 
like um and i get it right pjw is a guy with a huge following probably doesn't want to divide his audience he wants to stay in his lane you know i'm gonna go at the woke and all of that um there's been a few times where pjw there, there was that video of his i played on uh unpopular opinions that suggests that he's a bit more clued in than you'd imagine and he uh, he was surprisingly like in terms of where he landed on the old spectrum here he has been squarely in the middle here he's been in that center square i'm only for my own people don't try to make me don't try to make me kind of love israel here um just because it's jews dying now uh you know he didn't i mean he more or less said that because um, that was really, if you remember, right at the start of this, what was they were trying to make you kind of feel rage and anger about it rather than their usual thing, which is light a candle, don't look back in anger, let's go to a vigil, you know. Um, so I think PJW had the same kind of response that a lot of people did. Um, but I would say that in general, he is not really covering this issue he is um almost kind of sitting it out so on that basis he's kind of gonna go down here um so uh yeah um yeah i mean i and i i get it right this is a difficult issue to talk about uh pjw's got a lot of people who watch him he, you know he, he i i i understand that he wants to play it safe on this which is fine uh, next has been Rudy Giuliani. Um, now I subscribed to a whole bunch of channels from uh, back in the like the Copium Den days, and like um, there's a whole like there's a magosphere, right? They do Trump stuff. It's all Trump, 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 and Giuliani's part of that. Now, one thing I'll mention is that in general, the magosphere have also been kind of not bothered about this. They're just not interested. Um, there, in fact, there's a whole bunch of MAGA channels who haven't even mentioned the war. I'm talking about like Viva, like all of those lawyers. They're just watching the Trump trials. They're just following like Trump blow by blow what's going on in these trials. Okay. When everybody else is watching Middle East stuff, they're still focused on that. So, but interestingly, um, <clears throat> interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that PJW in general is a D. I think he's in that. I think he's a net positive too. I'm just saying he's sitting this one out. I'm not having a go at PJW. I'm saying he's his uh, coverage of this has been lukewarm at best. Anyway, Giuliani, as you can imagine, has just been all out, all out Zio shell. Like just, just hideous all out Zio shell, uh, lacking any sort of insight or nuance. He is just basically rah, 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 America. Let's have war with Iran and all the rest of it. So uh, Giuliani has been absolutely terrible. Absolutely terrible. So, uh, yeah, uh, let's carry on. Uh, here's Steve Turley. And there's, look, look that's, that's a Turley video basically saying, um, um, the headline says, Trump just got incredible 2024 news. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Um, probably just a poll saying Biden's not doing well or whatever. But anyway, Turley did make one video on this. On on At the very start of the conflict, he made one video where he addressed what was going on. Um, and actually, it was, it was like a clip from some longer stream that he'd done. And as I mentioned before, there's um, there's the typical Steve Turley and then there's serious Steve where he's a bit more somber and he's, do he's not doing the high voice and all the rest of it. And on this occasion, he was serious Steve. And um, he actually gave a pretty nuanced take on because the question was there was a, there was a there was a either a Zionist Christian or a Jew, or a Jewish uh, lady on the stream with him. And she was like, uh, I'm not going to try to do the accent, but, you know, that kind of squawky american voice that some of these types have you can imagine um but she was like oh you know i don't understand what why uh how can so many people be supporting palestine you know why aren't they supporting israel blah 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 and um basically steve turley gave, gave a 10 minute um 
monologue or you know explaining why people support pa Palestine in the conflict, which was pretty good. I thought he was surprisingly nuanced. And um, my overall impression is that this is not like a core cool MAGA interest, and they're kind of setting this out as well. So on that basis, I give Turley same same rank as PJW. Um, next we have uh, um, podcast of the Lotus Eaters or the Lotus Eaters. Uh, Carl Benjamin, who's a good buddy of mine, of course. Um, and I, I I would say that their coverage has been it's been creeping over to being counter jihad. I would say. They're over here. I get the impression that they don't want to touch this rung at all. And they've been, I would say they're drifting over to being counter jihad. Um, they did do one stream. I saw Dan did a stream with uh, where they were kind of going into the history of the conflict and so on. But they were starting like 3,000 years ago um, rather than the obvious place to start, which would be you know, about 1890 or something like that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I would say that they've been trying to use this conflict basically to um, further other political ends, uh, you know, victories against the woke and so on. Uh, for example, this um, this headline here says, in, in the image, it says queers for Palestine. And the and the caption is who's going to tell them. So, uh, I mean, I, I kind of get it. I get politically what what they're trying to go for here. But I'm afraid we've seen we, we've seen how this goes before. Um, you think, well, let's make common cause with the Zionists on this. And maybe we can use the issue to highlight the problems with immigration and and to use kind of counter jihad arguments to get some action from the elites on getting these people out of the country. Okay. I get it, right? I get the gambit. I get the gambit. Trouble is, it doesn't work. We've seen it all before. Counter jihad doesn't work. Um, and in fact, what will happen is that they'll use this moment, the elites will, to bring in even tighter restrictions on speech, hate speech and whatever. And then they'll use those exact laws that they bring in, they'll, the exact measures they bring in using the cover of this crisis, they'll then use to crack down on your counter jihad rhetoric when it all dies down over there. Guarantee it. You can't make common cause. Enemies are enemies, no matter what. You can't make common cause with them. This is why counter jihad doesn't work. So, uh, you know, not having a go at uh, Lotus Eaters, I get what they're trying to do. But in my view, it's just not going to cut the mustard in 2023. So I'm going to put them as a D as well. Now, in terms of uh, the pro-Israeli stuff that um, the pro-Israeli stuff I've seen, by far the most hardcore Zionist that I can bear to watch, because I, I can't stand Ben Shapiro. I, I can't, even as interested in it as I am in this, I, I can't watch Ben Shapiro. I just can't stand it. Um, and Many other people are just sitting this out. Like I've noticed, uh, like Aaron, Aaron McIntyre say he's staying in his lane. You know, he just wants to talk about woke stuff. Or, um, um, you know, I've seen Matt Walsh do a few, like, kind of, where were you doing all the anti-white stuff dunks? But they're trying to use it, you know, he's trying to use it for his own, his own kind of causes. I, I get all that, that's fine. Um, what I'm focusing on is coverage of this conflict. And this woman here is called Carolyn Glick. And uh, she's listened to by a lot of the hardcore kind of Netanyahu fans and so on. She's kind of hardcore pro-Israel. 
Uh, she had an interview here with uh, Victor um, Victor Davis Hanson, uh, who's pretty neoconny, I would say. And uh, it's, I actually think that she is um, not bad in terms, if you like, if the aim is what are the Israelis saying? What is the what is Israel's thinking? What are the talking points that they that they've got? How are they processing this? Um, pretty much, Karen and Glick um, gives you a kind of sober analysis of what's happening. Um, although I would say that even she has been on the verge of tears at times uh, since this began. Um, I get the impression that they're very rattled over in the Zionist camp. Um, so on all of those bases, I'm giving her a B. Uh, not that I agree with her position, just in terms of like, what is the coverage here? You see, it's a kind of interesting thing because if you have a look, this Victor Davis Hansen uh, interview is called Biden is not with Israel. Um, Biden is not with Israel. Biden isn't with Israel. Their whole thing is basically criticizing America for not supporting them enough. That's the whole play. Like, you're not supporting us. It doesn't matter if you put the White House in the Star of David. It doesn't matter if you give us $16 billion. It doesn't matter how much lip service you pay. You're not doing enough, basically. And that's always there, kind of, you're not supporting us enough. Because the thing is, with the I've learned with the hardcore Zionists, is that 95% isn't enough for these people. They want 100% compliance with what they want. And if you don't give them that, they react like, like that guy was reacting in... Um, like that guy reacted in the United Nations, you know, the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations basically had a like a like a hissy fit in front of the entire world uh, calling for the UN um, secretary general to resign um, because he dared uh, suggest that there was any sort of wrongdoing on Israel's part. Um, so. They um they demand one hundred percent compliance with them, and if you if you're only ninety percent or if you're lukewarm, it's not enough. You're an anti semite. You hate Israel, and um, this is basically where they are with Joe Biden. Joe Biden is too tepid. He's not like gung ho enough. He's not supporting them enough, um, and that's where a lot of the a lot of the talking points on the Karen and Glick show are, but it's a good, the reason I'm listing here as a B here is that it's tolerable. It's listenable. Unlike Shapiro and stuff where I just can't make it through. Can't even make it through 10 minutes of him. Um, next person here is uh, David Kutan. Uh, his video was called Israel Palestine call for a ceasefire. And he's done several others. Um, uh, considering uh, he's got his own political party and so on, Kurtan, I would say, is surprisingly based on this issue um, and has more or less had the same kind of take, you know, really don't get drawn into this, don't let yourself be propagandized. Um, and, uh, you know, has basically kind of called out the the kind of little trap that's laid for people here where, you know, they want you to support both support this war and then on the flip side support the, the 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 refugees when they eventually come from Palestine down the road. Um so Kirtan, I would say generally has been a good solid C on this. Okay. Patrick Casey had uh Unz on. He had um Ron Unz on who is a very well read guy, he knows a huge amount about this topic. And um, I would say the interview with Unz is it is is a, is, an, is a must listen, right? So if you haven't listened to any of these shows, the interview with Unz 
you know, a lot of good stuff in there. Um, so Casey himself, like, I mean, Casey himself, um, you know, he's a bit like Scott Greer, where he kind of has a lot of um, kind of inside baseball takes on what's going on in Washington and so on. But I mean, mainly this interview is uh, is just on is just him interviewing Uns and Uns laying out a lot of the history behind this conflict, a lot of what has happened. Um, I thought he was very good in terms of where Uns is. Um, I'd say he's probably he was quite think of the children, but he was also he's down here somewhere. I would I, I would say um, probably a bit more invested on the anti on the kind of pro palestine side than i would like but uh in general i thought he he gave a pretty good um gave a pretty good interview there uh sticks hexenhammer actually has been surprisingly nuanced on this um no 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 sticks i find frustrating because after all these years he still very much sticks to his kind of soft libertarian, you know, his libertarian talking points. And then every issue comes down to team red and team blue with, with sticks. It's always still kind of, oh, the Republicans and the Democrats, the Republicans and the Democrats. So, I mean, I, um, I often don't like, you know, sticks up lows like three times a day. I, I, often don't click on him um but i have been recently because i'm i'm interested in this and yeah i mean he's not up for neo he's not up for the neocon stuff basically um and he kind of sees it and uh he's been all right he's been all right so i'm going to stick him with kutan here when it comes to his coverage of this um he's he's been he's been fine um no, I, I look. If you notice, I'm not. I am not ranking this for neutrality. Right, Uns is far from neutral, but he provided a really good stream. Judith Butler is not neutral, and Karen and Glick is not neutral. They're in fact on polar opposite ends of this of this debate. Um, a lot of the neutral people have been down here, in terms of the actual streams they've done. Um, the only actual shit tier have been these ones down here. So. Um, yeah, it's not neutrality. I'm, I'm what I'm going for is what I'm rating this on is how good was the coverage, how important and vital was the information, how good was the in level of insight and the intelligence with which they discussed these things, regardless of where they were coming at it from. Um, so yeah, this is what I'm rating things for. Okay, uh, Pete Conones uh, has had on. I think two guests on this from memory. There was um, Matthew Raphael Johnson, who had a superb interview with him. He, I think he presents Radio Albion or something normally, um, which is a show I don't listen to, but I did check out, but I couldn't really find. I was begging around on Radio Albion looking for Israel stuff, but he mainly just said the same sort of stuff he said on, on Quinones. Um and then there was another stream with Lucas Gage, um, which I think was a bit more variable in its quality. Um, I didn't agree with a lot of Lucas Gage's kind of strategy stuff. Um, like he was, uh, he was very engaged with the the kind of Keith Woods lot. I think is is my understanding, and. Um, I just, uh, I don't know, I thought he was a bit incoherent on strategy bits, uh, which is fine, you know. Um, he was uh, he was all right, I would say, and Matthew Raphael Johnson was at least eight here. So splitting the difference, I'll say Pete's coverage has been right around here. Um I would listen to the math to the Johnson show before the gig gauge. So if I was you, but if you have time, listen to them both because there was there was good stuff in the in the gauge in the gauge show. Um, there was a there was good stuff. What was refreshing about him is that he was just a uh, gauge was just like straight up. <laughs> My position is I'm against Israel. 
<laughs> and that kind of made me laugh. He was just like, I don't care about Palestine, but I'm again, like my whole thing is I'm against Zionists. <laughs> and I, and I, I, I dug that. I dug how refreshing that, uh, uh, dug how refreshing that was. But um, yeah, I would say that out of the two of them, the better info was in the Matthew, the Matthew Raphael Johnson show. Uh, he is a guy who seems to know an awful lot about this in general um, and about the history of it and so on and so forth. Uh, from a, I get the impression he may be Orthodox of Orthodox Russian or something like that, Russian Orthodox. Um, but he, he just seemed to know an awful lot about like Eastern Europe and you know history and where they came from, all that sort of stuff. So that was interesting. Uh, next person here, this is Frody and Mark Weber, the guide to culture, um, on the weekly roundup. Now that happens 8 p.m. every week just before unpopular opinions. So I very often have to catch it on the replay because I'm usually preparing for UO when it goes on. Sometimes if I really got things together, I can listen to it as I'm preparing for unpopular opinions. Um, generally it's a very good show. It's one of my, uh, regular rotation shows that I listen to all the time. Uh, I think I've listened to every single episode of that show since it started. Um, but Mark Webber, he knows a lot about history. And in fact, his, he's a kind of World War II expert really, and, uh, and a revisionist historian and, you know, knows a lot about the Cold War and just knows a lot about different things been around a long time and um as you can imagine uh his coverage of this uh, with frody has been excellent uh frody has also dug up a lot of history that the israelis would like you to forget about um you know he's been playing clips of like president truman and you know the various kind of attacks on the british that happened and that you know they 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 right from the very start of um, the nation of Israel kind of being born in its current form, um, they, they kind of fill in all of the, all of the gaps really. Um, so I would say that uh, they have been pretty, they've been pretty ST here as well, to be honest. Um, can I zoom the screen a bit? Let's see. Is that any better? Is that any better? Is that better? Can you see a bit more? Okay. Maybe I'll make myself. Yeah, there we go. Oh. Uh, yeah, there we go. We can do it like that. We can do it like that. Okay, so yeah, that is uh, Guide to Culture Weekly Roundup. Um, I don't know if there's a podcast. I listen to it, I watch that on Odyssey. But um, yeah, I think there's a. It goes out on D Live and various other things as well, but uh, yeah, weekly roundup with Mark Weber has been absolutely S tier, I would say as well. Um, and basically, since the conflict began, they've done very good. Kind of, they've gone into the history because the thing is about this conflict, you have to know the history of how it came about, what it's been, what what they're actually fighting about now, what their aims are. And that has been, you know, um, you know, if you listen, if you just listen to Weber and Uns, you'd, you'd get it in, you'd get most of it in two or three hours. So, anyway, let's continue. The next show, the next one here is this is E. Michael Jones. E. Michael Jones. Now, E. Michael Jones has just written a book about the Holocaust that he's shilling. Um, so, he's trying to tie everything back to that and focusing on he's focusing a lot on how much the the pro-israeli side are bringing up uh the holocaust to justify what they're doing at the moment uh this was also amazingly highlighted by the uh guardian did people see this uh i thought you michael jones was uh was lying when he said this uh or i was or i did a double take but let me just uh, find that headline because I was like, whoa, something's happening here. Uh, hold on a minute. 
Uh, uh, um, let me see if we can find this. Give me a second, folks. Oh, sorry. On, why is it getting dark? The bloody clocks went back. That's why it's so dark. Um, have a look at this. The Guardian. Israel must stop weaponizing the Holocaust by Raz Segal, who is a scholar. He's like a Holocaust specialist, this guy, Raz Segal. He's a scholar of genocide. So like I said, I, th I think something's happening. Uh, I really do. I think something interesting is happening uh, in terms of the discourse because... The PR campaign has gone so badly that you know they've they've lost a lot of the room, and for the Guardian to put that out in the middle of all of this is kind of remarkable. Now they got serious pushback, they got serious criticism for that, but it's like we have a situation. I mean, we've literally got a situation where the Guardian are using E. Michael Jones talking points on their front page. That's an E. Michael Jones talking point on the front of The Guardian. So that, that was kind of remarkable. Um, so anyway, in terms of uh, E. Michael Jones himself, um, he's had like various different appearances. Um, trouble is with E. Michael Jones is that he's always got that kind of Sneaky, sneaky Catholic agenda thing going on where like in their discussion they were trying to say like oh the only really safeguard against all of this happening is Catholicism it's just, it's just bollocks isn't it it's just, just not true um, so uh, yeah unfortunately uh, quite too much of his interviews I thought were taken up with that sort of stuff you know you're going on about the Logos and you know <sighs> Like, it, it really, is that what we really want? Like, the more, like, two, when you've got, like, um, Netanyahu talking so, talking about being the people of the light versus the people of the darkness, and um, uh, Erdogan talking about, you know, it's the cross versus the crescent. With, you know, basically like biblical rhetoric here. You want more, like, crazy religious people thrown into the mix? Because I don't. I made a call for Rich Dawkins to like redouble his efforts at the moment. Like, uh, I think Richard Spencer said there needs to be a new new atheism. I mean, <laughs> you know, I've seen enough like crazy Zionist pastors in America this past week to last me a lifetime. I just, I mean, I don't think we should be running countries like this or running foreign policy based on what two thousand euro book said in twenty twenty three. Call me a uh, Call me a modernist, friends, but I just, it's, I mean, it's just ridiculous. So, um, yeah, so I'm kind of, I'm put off by that element. I would say that Jones has been about a C, uh, about a B, about a B, about the same as uh, the Karen and Glick and the Quinones. Um, next, um, the, now, right. I, I'm going to have to rant a little bit here. The next is is the spectator, is the spectator, and um, the spectators. The spectators' coverage has been fucking awful. It's been just, I, I just have no words for how much I hate the centre right at the moment. I mean, they okay. They've been doing a bit of like Douglas Murray counter jihad stuff. But like, I mean, let me let me just show you. Um, what was this called? This was one that came up on my feed earlier today. It was called. Um, where, where, where was it? Yasha Munk. Why won't the West support Israel? And then they ran a, a story the other day, um, basically saying, "Oh, Britain is not doing enough for Israel." So this is like the the, the Spectator's whole shtick now. Um, is basically to push pro like Israeli government talking points, 
and call for more help and funding for Israel. Um, like, uh, for example, this, like any normal person would look at that, right? This Yasha Monk interview with a spectator only aired a couple of hours ago. It starts off with the, the guy, Yasha Monk, saying, oh, I remember back in 9-11, like, you know, the world, like, Everybody in the West responded with horror at 9-11. Why aren't they doing the same? Why aren't people responding the same to the Hamas attack as they were responding to 9-11? And the interviewer did not, did not come back with the obvious point that any sane and normal person would make, which is that the reason that responded, people responded to 9-11 the way they did is because it was in fucking New York. And, and many Americans, you know... We're like, oh, this is an attack on my country. The reason that people did not respond in the same way to the Hamas attacks is because Israel is a foreign country. As simple as that. People would just be like, yes, yeah, 3,000 miles away in the Middle East. And that's just, just, just an obvious point. These people are meant to be, you know, the highest IQ of all time. And this doesn't occur doesn't occur to anyone that they're not going to respond the same to that as they did to 9-11 just kind of boggles my mind so anyway the the spectator have been doing i think the worst job of any major outlet covering this story um because if you listen to this interview this interview with uh um yasha mook right he's he's just written a book against right he's just written a book this guy against identity politics okay so so the whole interview basically tries to use the current conflict in an attempt to show the dangers of woke ideology the dangers of i quote unquote identity politics minutes after yasha munk asked with a straight face sitting in the middle of London, why British people don't respond to, um, you know, the deaths of Israelis in the same way that they respond to British people. He then wants to shill this anti-woke book he's written about the dangers of identity politics. And then he argues, his thesis is that Basically, it's, this is where it's ended up with the left being pro-Palestine. Because of critical race theory, the left support Palestine. Now, on its face, that thesis should be de facto in absurd to everybody listening to this show. The left do not support Palestine because, of the, because they're woke. The left do not support Palestine because of critical race theory. The left have always supported Palestine, for one. And the second reason that they don't support it because of that is because, in their eyes, the Palestinians are a dispossessed people being smashed by a fully armed, uh, well-funded modern state. Right? So, I mean, you don't need wokes, wokeness, identity politics, critical race theory, or anything else to see that when you look at this conflict. The left were always going to support Palestine in this, and they always have done. So, 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 I mean, I, I, again, I understand that a channel like The Spectator, you know, they, they've got to find an angle, or this guy's got a book to shell, or whatever, but please. Treat the audience with a little bit of respect. Put a, put a, you know, you have to, um, you know, they're, they're trying to use it as an angle now to attack like left wing politics, you know, because uh, people support uh, people support Palestine because of the trannies. People support Palestine because I mean, it's just rub it's just rubbish. Um, it's just rubbish. It really is. So, you know, I mean, I, I understand, right? It's an opportunity to put the woke away. 
and that's what they're going to try to do. This is the call I made for many years. This is my bet with Aaron McIntyre. But ironically, <laughs> that is not happening because the Israelis have captured the part of the apparatus that has no respect. Right? They have captured the people who end up talking, using their enemy talking points in five years' time. So I don't think this is going to work. I really don't. And in fact, I think, if anything, the arguments they're using are so bad that they're going to turn most people who aren't idiotic boomers away. Right? Most people listening to this show should be sympathetic to this idea that, um, you know, the lunatic left, the lunatic left, you know, they're destroying this country. That's why all these foreigners are here or whatever. But they are not, they're not going to be sympathetic if it comes wrapped up with this kind of uh, disingenuous analysis um, that they're trying to, you know, that they're basically doing the, it, it's just a, another version of the David Badil. Jews don't count. And I call this coming a mile off that they would try to use this. And they, I think the uh, it's accelerated since the since the Hamas uh, attack. It, it has accelerated. But I think it's not working. I really don't think it's working. Um, and in fact, I think it's doing the opposite. I think it is giving the left a moral legitimacy it hasn't had for many years. The left, when they're just down to, you know, when the left were down to transgender bullshit and BLM and all the rest of it, the left were losing the room. The left were had no moral authority. When the left is just kind of, um, you know, you're a colonial oppressor, you're BLM, um, you know, we're BLM and, you know, we want to tear down your statues. And um, we hate the orange man, but orange man bad and all the rest of it. And, uh, you know, you didn't take the vaccine. So, you know, I wish death upon you and all of this. When the left is that, the left is losing the room. When the left is sticking up for kids who are being bombed and you are basically saying like, yeah, we stand with the bombers. You're giving them moral legitimacy, I'm afraid. You, you're... I watched, for the first time ever, Greta Thunberg do something authentic. Greta Thunberg, remember, she's, a, she's an absolute puppet of the regime under normal circumstances. But now you've got wealthy, powerful billionaires accusing her of being a anti-Semite because she has an octopus plushie. That's how you lose, that's, that is how you lose the room. And, and and unfortunately, what I'm what I'm seeing happening in real time is moral legitimacy draining away from anyone on the right who supports all any of this stuff, and the left gaining power, gaining moral power. I have never seen them as vital as this since probably 2016, which was a major loss for them. This this I would say is going their way. So. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think it's a, I think it's a tactical error, uh, for any of us to be throwing in our lot with the spectator and people like this at this moment. Um, they are, uh, you know, it's, it's bad. It, it's bad because this, this issue, this single issue of, uh, of Israel, um, uh, how can I say it's, it's like a kind of, um, it's like a kind of wrecking ball for everything else, if that makes any sense. Um, so, yeah, we will we'll, we'll, we'll come back uh, to that in a moment because, uh, oh, yeah, I have to, so the spectator gets an F. The spectator is, is currently morally and intellectually bankrupt in a way that I've never seen it before. It's just, it's just hideous. I mean, you look at this conflict going on now, and you use it to shill a book about why identity politics is bad. And, and this is meant to be your kind of center right. 
Oh, it's just hideous. I hear it's to turn my stomach. So, the, so the next person I'm going to mention here uh, has been Dickie Spencer, um, and him and Mark Brahman do a show on Substack called called Alexandria. They never actually call it that. The channel is called that, but they just kind of do a show every week, um, and usually it starts with a uh, Dickie giving about a twenty minute monologue, and then he opens it up and other people start you know call in essentially um in fact if uh, dicky if you listen to this i reckon you just stew away with the members just have it you and just why don't you just have it you and mark and fuck everyone else i don't know what they bring they don't bring anything to the table uh the other guests on that show um but anyway they have had some extremely interesting streams on this and uh i i would say it's a major return to form for him uh you know he's been Spent like the past few years like shilling Biden. He was like a Ukraine shill, you know, just generally speaking, like pretty much like becoming a leftist in all in all ways, basically a kind of racist liberal. Um, I always I always maintained, I've always listened to Spencer's show, by the way, um, because he he always has intelligent analyses of the boomer cons and the conservatives and MAGA and stuff like that which often end up coming true in the long run. That's why I've always listened to Spencer. I know everybody hates him, right? But he always has stuff that ends up coming true in six months. Like, he's he's usually there about a year before everybody else. He's got a way of seeing stuff coming down the pike that everybody else misses. And then, like, fast forward, I don't know, 18 months, and everybody's now got Spencer's line. But they, no, nobody gives him credit for it, obviously. Um, so th- th- that's why I've always listened to listened to him because of the number of times that has happened. Uh, I will say there's a number of times that has not happened as well. Uh, U- Ukraine being probably the major one. Um, but uh, yeah, he's been very good on this. I think um, being a, a little bit older than me, he he lived through, and this is what I found, a lot of the people who lived through the Iraq war and the neocon George W. Bush era neocons are pretty well clued up on this issue in general, like well read about the Middle East. Um, and uh, I mean, Spence has been very good at highlighting the religious elements of this conflict. Um, and he's been very good at looking at the um, the kind of social status, the, sto- the social dynamics uh, you know, that, all that stuff I was saying earlier on about Judith Butler was the sort of thing that Dickie has been saying as well. Um, now, his, he's also done a number of Twitter spaces, and there's a guy on YouTube. I don't know if he's connected with Dickie at all, but he uh, he then uploads the, the Twitter spaces to YouTube so you can listen to them afterwards. Um, it's called Angel Dust or something. I don't know if that's like a pirated show or what, but that's how I that's, I very rarely listen to Twitter spaces, but I usually do the catch up on YouTube. Um, and really, I would say that Spencer's big call on this whole conflict is that in a few years time, he thinks that the Star of David, that the blue, like the Israel flag will be thought of in the same way that people think of the swastika and uh, the mid-century Germans. He is convinced that the people in and around Netanyahu are so mad and so kind of mental that, and the West is in a kind of spiritual and moral place right now where it's kind of, it tends to go with what the left says and it tends to go with the, the liberal moral values, rights, human rights, and all the rest of it that um, he thinks basically that it's almost inevitable that in a few years' time, support for Israel will be seen almost like support for the mid-century Germans, which which I, which I which is a very bold, provocative take, which is the sort of thing that he's good at. Um, Brahman has been good values on these shows as well. Um, Brahman's big thing has been that... Um, uh, <clears throat> Brahman's uh, big take has been uh, that uh, Israel is losing 
legitimacy, the state of Israel is losing le- legitimacy in real time. And I, I think these two two things, whether you're pro-Israeli or anti-Israeli, um, are basically true. I mean, this is just like a value a value free take on what is actually happening in the media, what is actually happening in the, in the chattering classes, what is actually happening in real time, um, in, even in conservative circles and centre right circles. Uh, I, I think that I honestly think. Israel has lost the room. I really do. Um and um yeah, so a lot of the a lot of very good analysis from uh Spencer Abraman. I would say they have been S tier as well. Um um they've now they've done a lot of streams, right? And you'll see they're like two or three hours long. Usually what happens though is that the good stuff is in the first hour, and then for some reason. Spencer has like a lot of spazdicks who come on, come on and just ask like retarded questions. Um, I don't know why he does that. I don't know why he likes having like, like other people on the call. Um, there is one epic moment where he, he finishes this kind of monologue and somebody asks him some, some like stupid question and he just goes ape shit and goes on like a 10 minute rant and bans them from the call. That was cool. I enjoyed that. <laughs> Do uh, I mean if he did more of that, I would I would dig it. But um, in general, the good stuff is in the first hour. So you could probably like once once he opens up the show, a lot of the time you can probably switch to the next one if you if you've got limited time. So um, let's uh, let's carry on. Uh, and the next person here, oh yes, uh, black pilled. Um, now he, I would say, is um, hold on a minute. He, I'm gonna have to open up a new tier for him because he has been SS tier. All of his streams have been fucking phenomenal on this show, uh, on, on this topic. Um, I kind of, you know, he, I don't know how many I've yet to kind of figure out his schedule. But he's done like five, five, four or five shows, um, and they're all just amazing. Um, history, clips, hidden history, um, just just phenomenal stuff, I would say. So he has had the best coverage of anybody, Black Pilled. Um, I'd put him up there, uh, and then I'd put, uh, I'd put Spencer and Brahman and uh, would be the next if I had to kind of rank them like that um okay so yeah i mean that is the absolute tops uh if you've only got a few hours to spare just watch his streams in order i would and you'll probably know anything and everything there is to know about um this conflict i would say with prior warning that he is pretty anti-zionist um uh which is you know putting it mildly and uh he is not on YouTube and therefore has license to uh, speak openly, as it were. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you're uh, sensitive to that sort of thing, probably not for you. But uh, I uh, I mean, I don't care about any of that sort of stuff. I just think it's um, the information is brilliant. And he is probably one of the major reasons why I've been kind of slight. Like the more I've learned about this issue, stuff I didn't know, stuff, um, I, I don't know, he just kind of, he he uncovered a lot of info on this topic that was new to me, and I thought I knew a lot about this topic, but it turns out there's a lot more I didn't know. Um, there's this whole, like, BBC documentary he digs out about the nuclear program, for example. Um, very interesting stuff. And... Um, Honestly, it's it's kind of like I mean I'm sticking to my line of being neutral on this, of being like on the basis that this is not like my conflict, right? It's not. Um, it doesn't really concern us. It only concerns us to the point where the British government is funding any of these things, right? But the more you learn, the m- the more difficult I think it is to be. 
uh, pro-Israeli, I have to say. I just don't understand. Like, I understand it if you're Israeli, right, or if your father is, or if you have both parents who are. And I possibly even understand it if you're like a Ben Shapiro type, okay? Because, they, you know, you've got to stand for your own people at the end of the day. I don't understand it if you're, if you're not. I really don't. Um, while I do understand why people don't like seeing children killed and things like that, okay? Even though I am a, I am a mean to seeing like, oh, think of the children, look at the suffering, look at the bombing and all that. I mean, I just don't, I mean, you know, I don't care about that sort of stuff. But I understand why the leftist types take the positions they do, right? So I understand intellectually and emotionally how people can become pro-Palestinian. I do not understand intellectually or emotionally how non-Jewish people can take a kind of ardently hardcore pro-Israel stance. I just don't get it. Um, and I still don't get it. I still don't know. Like, what makes Douglas Murray tick, for example? Like, why is he so in the tank for them? And uh, I can only conclude it's because he's paid off or he's blackmailed or something. There's, there's no other explanation because on pretty much every issue, um, if you if you dig into the history, if you watch those black pill streams, it's just it's not justifiable. It really isn't. Um, the only way that you can justify it really is with a kind of all out Nietzschean will to power, right? Nietzschean will to power. Um, I would say, all right, you could say, well, might is right. Okay, so you could kind of justify it from a from a Nietzschean point of view, but that still wouldn't explain siding with them, right? It wouldn't explain siding with them. Um, it would only explain being kind of, okay, this sort of thing happens, it's always happened, right? And I get, I get that point of view. What I don't understand is becoming the all-out Zio Shill when you're not one of them. Don't get it. Um, all right. So let us uh, carry on. Um, so, see, the thing is, is that I'd also respect the Israelis more if their stance was just will to power, but it's not. Their stance is not that. Right. I mean, on uh, the, the black pill stream he's got like this little bell or little noise that goes off every time they mention the holocaust and it's i mean some of these interviews are just insane like like we're talking like 12 15 times in the space of three minutes and things like that um it's kind of mad it really is kind of mental um so yeah, usually I can intellectually understand both sides of an issue. On this, I just don't. I mean, and the more I learn about it, the more I don't understand where Douglas Murray is coming from. And I can only, I mean, I can only assume he's just on the pit, on the Mossad payroll at the end of the day. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there is another angle, of course. Um, there are the crazy American kind of Christian evangelical types who, you know, are you know, millennialists or they believe they want the third temple to come or whatever bullshit. Um, like, I kind of understand, okay, right, there are some, you have some nutty religious views and therefore you support this. Um, but, you know, I'm... <laughs> I can only, that's, that's still a kind of, that's not something that anybody rational can get behind, right? You have to kind of be indoctrinated into some crazy religion to, to oh, it says in this bit, says in this bit of uh, the Bible that, you know, all, all of that sort of stuff. I mean, any normal sane person is going to be lost by any of that sort of stuff. Um, and um, if, in fact, I, I'm interested to know how, Netanyahu quoting the, the the Bible or the Torah 
has gone down. Like, what? who is that for? Is it for his domestic audience, or is he doing that just for, like, the kind of the American boomers? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I just don't understand those. Those are, I mean, it, to me, they may be your, like, they may be your people, but I just don't recognize, like, I have always found that stuff alien to me. It's just, I just don't get it at all. Um, don't get it. Uh, I mean, to, uh, yeah, let's carry on. Um, next person here is Jeff Taylor, who I have, I have wanted to make my Steve Turley of this conflict. Uh, let me just zoom in a little bit so you can see this. Um, here's Jeff Taylor. Look, you, UN sides with Hamas. Unhappy, unhappy Jeff. Um, Jeff has basically gone all out boomer Zionist on this. He's just an all out. He's just kind of. And what what kind of staggers me about this guy, right? Jeff Taylor, is that Jeff, um, was like you know, pro Brexit. He was kind of um, anti. Uh, he was kind of anti lockdown. He was, you know, generally speaking. He's on the right of many issues. And yet on this, he's like, no, on this one, I'm going to go with the regime. On this issue, unlike on all any every other issue I can think of, I'm just going to go with the regime on this. So Jeff has been fucking woeful, to be honest. He's been terrible. Um, because you watch these videos, and I see this is the difference on this, right? This is the difference on this. You watch the Black Pill stream or the un or the, any of the ones I put up there, and they go into history and they go into you know real detail about this. You watch this crappy video down here, and it's just kind of like incoherent emotion, basically, and kind of raging and kind of you know trying to get you into engage in a bit of low IQ bigotry or whatever. It's just crap. It really is just crap. There's no like, and, and that's why I that's why I put Glick up there, by the way, because Glick is the only one really on that side of things who actually goes into a bit of detail and actually kind of tries to explain what's happening and so on and so forth. I mean, she's still pretty uh, one sided and blinkered, but at, at at the very least, she's she's giving you something. I mean, this stuff coming out of, like, The Spectator and Taylor, I, there's nothing there for you. Um, that's not going to persuade anybody who's not already on your side, right? I mean, Jeff Taylor's presupposing a lot of things in that video. A lot of things that the people on the other side of this conflict do not take for granted. So, yeah, the Taylor, the, the Taylor stuff is just rubbish. Um, and I can only imagine... That uh, various other people like that, like this, you know, couple of hundred thousand sub types. Uh, who's that guy? I met him once, Iranian dude, M Mayor Mayor Tauzi, What's his name? He came on proper. I mean, I can I can only imagine him producing this sort of stuff as well. Crap, rubbish. I mean, it's not even um, it's not even red meat because I just don't know who it appeals to, other than like other other boomers essentially. This is a kind of boomer material. Um, it would be interesting to know. Um, in fact, I might double check to see if there's been a drop off or an increase in Jeff Taylor in Jeff Taylor views since this started. Because um, uh, you know. Uh, Okay, so they haven't they haven't done great these videos of his. Um, okay, yeah, but his I mean his stuff has been just really really bad on this, Pro probably one of the worst I've I've ever seen. So uh, sorry, Jeff. I don't know if he watches. He probably doesn't isn't not even aware of me. So um, there. Okay, so the next person here that we're going to look at is. No more news. This is uh, Adam Green. 
Now, for whatever reason, I have never really been able to get into um, Adam Green stuff. There's something about him that doesn't chime. There's something about the way he approaches things and that whole kind of... I don't know. There's some, It's just something off-putting to me uh, about Adam Green. Um, and I just can't, like... I don't know. I, I very often kind of lose focus when I'm listening to him and things. I think it's because possibly he goes on... Like, I'm someone who analyzes arguments and I, I like information and I can kind of rearrange those things and I can track arguments and I can kind of rationally analyze what's going on. And um, Adam, I don't know. There's just something about that. It's a bit conspiracist. It's a bit kind of um, like, I mean, I, I did watch his streams though, because of course I have to get my fix. Um, you know, he's gone more on the emo he's gone more on the kind of think of the children stuff. Um yeah, so this uh, I, I'm, this is not put this is not like a personal attack on Adam Green or any of these people, but I have not uh, I have not resonated with his uh material on this. He's pretty anti Zionist, as you can imagine, by the way. He's you know, he uh he does not like um uh, you know the uh a lot of his content is about uh, these people. Let's just put it that way. Um, but of all of the ones I listen to, I just struggle to engage in that sort of stuff. It's too, like, it's a bit too out there for me. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, so I'm putting, um, I'm putting Adam Green. Uh, he's probably like b bottom, bottom of the D down here okay uh next i'm going to um and you know this is just a bit of fun like you know, like any of these people could make a similar thing and be like that academic agent his coverage has been shit i listened to unpopular opinions they didn't bloody say anything in three hours blue pill <laughs> so i mean i get it don't worry um i i can i can take it if any of these people want to say yeah well your stuff was crap on it as well mate that's fine. No, nothing personal. Um, all right. So the next person is there's a, there's a channel called um, it's called Redacted. Redacted. It's got like a couple of million subs, and um, this channel has people like uh, Douglas McGregor or like Scott. Rick, like it has like it's it's a it's a, it's a show that can highlight expert guests in that way and um they have had um yeah they they had had they have a lot of that kind of how, how, how could you put it like populist it's like the kind of retired general show you know hey it's i i i i'm on redacted and here's a former member of the cia to talk about talk us through why the regime is so full of shit or here's Douglas McGregor to tell you why the army is awful. You know, it's basically what it is. Um, so really the question with uh, redacted is how much do you rate Douglas McGregor pretty much or similar type guests like Scott, I'm pretty sure Scott Ritter was on there and you know, this is where a lot of those interviews take place is on this channel redacted. Um, I would say that they're, pretty much in and around this area here they're on the beat here um the, the problem uh in a way with mcgregor is that uh yeah okay he knows his military stuff and so on but he's got a habit of overrate or underrating the extent to which um foreign leaders have domestic political uh, concerns with which to balance their foreign policy against, right? And uh, McGregor's got this idea, basically, that Turkey could go, kind of go hot in this war, which is just not fucking going to happen. 
right? Erdogan has to respond right, when hundreds of thousands of people get on the streets of Turkey to protest. Erdogan, as the president, has to be out there and kind of like be like, "Yeah, I'm with you guys." Uh, you know, all the crowd is being like, "We hate Israel." Yeah, I hate Israel too. Yeah, because he has to. He has to say that he's the, he's the president. He is not going to jeopardize Turkey's place in NATO by attacking Israel. It's just not going to happen. Not going to happen. He will contain that energy. He'll give a couple of fiery speeches. He'll, you know, it, it's just not going to happen. I'm afraid. Um, and it's it's similar with many of the other. Um, nations, and as as this conflict has wore on, my own take, and I'll I'll talk about this on unpopular opinions as well, is that even if the US want to escalate, I don't think the other countries, Iran, any of the Arab nations, or Turkey, are interested in uh, committing troops for Israeli uh, for Palestine. Um. They just need to. I mean, it's it's almost like the um, West has been over Ukraine, right? Yeah, we'll send them money. Yeah, we'll you know Zelensky, but they've never put troops on the ground, have they? They've just kind of given moral support, and you've got to understand that a lot of these Middle Eastern leaders are full of shit, right? Oh, we have this direct. They they never fucking do anything. So, I mean, okay, maybe McGregor's, maybe in a couple of weeks we'll be in World War Three, and McGregor's right. I just don't see it happening, I'm afraid. So, you know, it's good, it's interesting. It's good and it's interesting. Um, but I do not, uh, I do not think McGregor, I just think he's, there are times where he, when his analysis is so fantastical that you should just kind of check yourself and think, Mate, that is not going to happen. You're not going to get it. I mean, it, it, for a moment when the emotions were high, it looked like, well, okay, we could get an amazing kind of um, Israel versus like the entire Muslim world, Turkey, the Arabs and the Iranians buddy up for for the first time ever in history type thing. Um, but they haven't done anything, have they? Israel have gone in to Gaza and they haven't done anything. And they continue not to do anything. Uh, in fact, Iran has been very quiet indeed. So I would, uh, I don't know. I just, I, f I feel like as the more this goes on, the, um, the less this conflict is going to escalate into major regional crisis or even world war. Uh, even if the neocons want even though, even if the neocons want that to happen, um, I don't think it's going to. Um, possibly Russia and China are the reason for that. Possibly the, the 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 Russians and the Chinese are in the ears of the Muslim leaders at the moment. Um, next, we have um, Alexander Mercurius. Uh, in fact, let's do the Duran first. Where's the Duran? Oh, I haven't got the Duran on their own. Uh, do I have the Duran? So we're not. Um, well, I should have had the Duran on their own. Um, okay, so let's just make this uh, quick and easy, okay? I'll put Mercurius up in the A. I'll put um, Christopher uh, on his own as B. And where's Duran? I'm gonna to have to make Duran uh, and Duran together as S. Okay, and I'll explain. I'll explain why in a second. Um, um, okay, let's try to get screen grab of the Duran. Uh, uh, okay, so let's talk about these a bit. So one of the things that these guys is that they're very consistent. They put out a lot of content. So for a junkie like me who's been wanting to listen to a lot, uh, the Duran have been very good because they put out a lot of stuff, right? So 
um, by far, these are the people that you'll end up listening to the most. Uh, see if I can add. Okay, I've, I've added actual Duran now. So there's actual Duran. Um, so the reason that uh, they're ranked in this way is that, as I said on Twitter earlier on, the dynamic between Mercurius and Chris and uh, how do you say his name? Christopher. Christopher. Anyway, there's Alex M. Let's say and Alex C. Alexander M. Alex C. The dynamic between those two is that Mercurius is this kind of like politics machine or geopolitics machine who processes a lot of information quickly, talks a lot. He's kind of got this particular manner of talking and you know he he does a lot of the uh what they call the readouts of you know official statements put out by the government what's going on in the un you know and they, he kind of tracks all of that detail very well in a way that you know most of us wouldn't even have the time to do right and he gets it all together uh the other alex alex c i always get the impression is much more of a kind of you know, he's much more like a kind of frog poster, shit poster. He's a bit more like one of us type thing. It's a bit more kind of dissident, a bit more populist. And um, he's got a bit, he's a bit more emotional. So the other Alex is almost like your kind of point of view character. Oh yeah, he's literally me, Alex C. And Alex M is just this kind of like robot almost, this kind of politics machine. Um, so the... Um, the reason I've ranked them like this is that because of that, Mercurius uses his own channel to do a lot of like information dumps. Okay. Now, a lot of these streams are like an hour long, an hour and a half. But when you actually listen to them, it's usually an article that he's reading, or it'll be something like that. He's reading through an article and then giving his commentary on it or something like that. That's why they're so long. Um, Alex C on his own is much more uh oh here look at this thing on Twitter or here's what they, like it's much more like oh look at this telegram post type thing and because of that Alex C often makes little he often uh puts things on there that are a bit too hot for the press right i.e stuff that was doing the rounds on social media that hasn't fully been fact checked yet and, I, and this week, I've seen it a few times where he's made a video and then the next day being like, oh, actually, I got this bit wrong. The other Alex came and told me, oh, you know, here's the actual info. So he occasionally makes mistakes. Mercurius is a bit more, being the, the lawyer that he was, you know, the barrister, is a bit more careful about stuff like that. So that's where the difference is between them. Um, even though I personally find... Alex C is a bit more personable and a bit easier to relate to. Um, whereas, uh, you know, I, I, as I said on Twitter, you get the impression that Alex M hasn't fed that dog that's barking in the background for like 10 days because all he does is kind of read <laughs> speeches from the Kremlin or whatever. So, um, and uh, anyway, on the Duran, which is the main show that they do together, it, it, that basically gives you a kind of uh, elite cut of the material that he's been covering on his own show or that they cover on their own shows filtered out and kind of made, it's like the kind of final edit. Um, and on that show, I think they do a good job of you get the balance of the two of them because Mercurius on his own doesn't half go on. I tell you like, you know, he talked for 90 minutes straight without coming up and then, like what, what, in fact, I kind of love his. I love his kind of um, uh, his autism in a way because he'll he literally speak for like ninety minutes without pausing, dog barking in the background, a fire alarm going off, you know, and then he'll just uh, he'll stop and you'll be like, "All right, I'll end the stream now." Good day, <laughs> and that's it. That's the end of the stream. It's kind of like you know, you know, there's no like natural pause there. Um, and I kind of like, there's definitely, there must be some level of autism 
in, in, in Mercurius. So, in a way, he needs a more human, kind of friendly, normal person to be with. And Alexei is pretty good in that role. Um, also, as time has gone on, there's a bit more, like, Alexei's got a lot of little in-jokes and things, like he always calls Biden Professor Biden. Um, and you get a bit more passion out of him. Like, you, I really think that uh, he... Uh, Alex C hates Joe Biden. Like he really hates him. And I kind of get a kick out of how much he hates Joe Biden. So um, yeah, I mean, I really like the Duran. I really like it. It's a great show um, and they deserve all their subs and all the rest of it. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, uh, that's how I'd rank them. And then next we have uh, the new culture forum. I uh, actually appeared on that show a while back. Unfortunately, they have also gone pretty counter jihad. Um, they have kind of flitted back into 2015 mode, mode pretty much. Um, I get the impression that uh, they're pretty like pro Israel on that channel. Uh, that's fine, you know, that's fine. I mean, um, but yeah, their content has really been kind of, they've been doing the same sort of thing. As Lotus Eaters, Counter Jihad, um, and like I like I said before, it's just not a very not a very good tactic. Uh, it hasn't worked before, hasn't worked before, won't work this time, and um, pretty much it's been disappointing to see the old kind of playbooks back again. I know Morgoth has uh, been complaining about it as well. He uh, he made a video Morgoth did called Once More Up the Garden Path. Um, uh, basically, I just co-sign everything he's, uh, Morgoth has said on this issue. I've got an old video um, called Tactical Bigotry, which you can dig up. Um, it's just like... Counter-Jihad is a trap, right? Because it locks you into a moral frame where you end up critiquing Islam from the left, from a liberal, leftist liberal point of view. And it's very hard to square that circle with DR talking points. Um, there are reasons not to be, like, there, there are good reasons to be anti-Islamic, right? Which are basically, that's something that happens over there, not here. This is not of the West. This is of the East. I am of the West. I am not of the East. Therefore, I am not a Muslim, right? End of. When you start going into um, typical counter jihad stuff, all you're doing is strengthening the regime and uh, other civilizational enemies, let's just say, within the regime and furthering their ends. You're not furthering your own ends. You're not. If you think for a second that this issue is going to get uh, those people that you saw in London deported or, I don't know, uh, going to get the Tory party to think again about whether they're going to allow Sadiq Khan to be the mayor of London, you've got another thing coming. All it will do is give them the tools in which further to control you. That's all that ever happens with counter jihad. So, yeah, I, I really don't believe... Uh, the strategy works at all um, and also I think that it, it leads to um, kind of nastiness that then will be used at a later date against you you know all this stuff about oh you know like you'll, you'll end up with the old talking points you know oh did you know Muhammad was a paedophile and all that it's just like all right so now on top of everything else you have to now start trying to be like disrespectful about a religion that over a billion people follow i mean it's kind of come on dudes you know so anyway it's a trap it always was a trap it always will be a trap um i will credit the person who really opened up my eyes to um counter jihad was actually jonathan bowden um he has a speech so i can't remember the exact speech but he he starts talking about how um, they're the only group really who can't be assimilated into like liberal, into like liberalism. Um, and why the regime will always keep 
what he called the far right and Islam, he'll always kind of keep them on retainer to act as a kind of civilizational enemy for the for the regime for the gay right um and um i uh yeah i i mean ever since ever since he said that something clicked in my mind then i read evola then i really kind of started under, understanding a lot and you know it's like uh I don't, you're not gonna you're not gonna achieve many political ends by raging against like bus drivers who or whoever these people are going to these pro-palestinian protests in london and elsewhere um or just like you know you're not going to further any ends um by essentially when the regime gives you permission um you know to have to engage in a bit of red meat bigotry against these people you know for zionist ends that i mean essentially all you're doing is uh i'm trying to put the best way of putting this uh i remember i quote tweeted morgoth uh it was it yesterday or the day before um with a with a you know do you remember um bolton in uh game of thrones when he has that sausage and he's kind of waving it a reek to go on take the sausage reek take the sausage reek that's all you're doing when you're doing the counter jihad right and, and it's just incredible to watch everybody shift back into this mode now the israelis have said now like you know the uh the center right basically have given you permission to do this again and then like in another two years when it's all died down oh now you're an islamophobe you, 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 like how many times are you going to walk into this it's like watching somebody walk into a rake over and over and over again it didn't work the last 15 times why is it going to work now it's rubbish it really is i mean it's like kind of Tommy Robinson over again, over and over and over again. So yeah, I, I'm 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 always I'm I'm really against. Uh, I just think it's stupid uh, counter jihad as a strategy. Um, I, I also think a lot of I, I also think a lot of um, a lot of wrong headed and silly talking points start getting made uh, when you start engaging in counter jihad, right? Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that many, many, many of these people, not all of them, some of them are from a, from a different, uh, for, for a different reason, which I'll get into in a second, but many of these people are only here because America bombed the shit out of their countries. I mean, they wouldn't, they literally, I mean, um, all of those Syrians who end up cutting your hair, why are they here? They're not here because Assad was gassing children. They're here because America fucked up their country. Why is why are all the Iraqis here, or, or, or bloody Libyans, or Lebanese people, or Kurds? They, they, these people are here because America has destabilized that entire region because of their irrational support for one particular country in that region. And there are videos. I, I don't have the time to pick them up now. Uh, but they used to do the rounds a lot back in the day of neocons talking about this as an active strategy of being like, oh, well, you know, if we keep if we keep this area bombed and unstable, that will create a constant stream of refugees and immigrants um, that we can then use to, you know, prop up the economies in the West or however they want to put it. You know, whether it's a benign reason in their mind or a malign reason, it doesn't matter, does it? Because the net result is they end up coming over here. So, that, I mean, this really is, I mean, they talk about sandwich, a pincer movement or a sandwich. It's always been the same. It's always been the same. And it's like, oh, right, well, these are uh, these great uh, civilizational enemies. They were, I mean, they, they weren't engaging in uh, acts of kind of terror in 
you know, 1928, were they? You didn't get like, you know, stabbings in Paris or suicide bombers in London in 1928. The actual cause of it is American foreign policy. It's always been American foreign policy. So, so it's, a, it's a kind of bullshit topic that every single aspect of it is something of the regime's creation. So when you go full counter jihad, all you're doing is strengthening the regime's own moral frame. Especially if you end up attacking Islam on liberal grounds. I mean, there's a good reason. They're not my people. I don't want them here. It's strong. That's good. And I think when Carl calls these people colonizers, that's not a bad moral frame. Because they shouldn't be here. Let's, let's face it, they shouldn't be here. Um, the trouble is, is when you direct the ire at those people themselves, rather than at the people who made this happen. As long as you're directing all of your energy and attention on the people who are, who are here, rather than the people who made it happen, the people who made it happen are winning. It's a simple point, but nobody grasps it. And if those people who made this happen were ever kind of removed in some way, the rest of it would sort itself out. The rest of it would sort itself out quickly. Or if, for example, the Middle East was stable again, a lot of these people would just get, end up going home. Many of them would. Many of them would end up going home. You think the average Syrian wouldn't rather be like back in Syria, safe, like in his tea house, uh, eating his eating his rice and kebabs or whatever? Of course, he'd rather be back home. He doesn't want to be sitting in London, sticking a rainbow dildo up his ass. So I really do think that the counter jihad ends up um, basically penetrating the discourse pun not intended, with shit and low IQ talking points, basically, and often historically and factually untrue talking points, because essentially they're working in the service of a lie. Uh, that's my honest view on it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do, I mean, I get the worry about Islam taking over, right? I get all of those concerns. Um. But uh, how can I put it? It wouldn't be such a problem, in my view, if it wasn't for the undying and unwavering support for a particular country in the Middle East. That is basically the source of a lot of this, both in terms of the ultimate source for the immigration in the, in the first place and the ultimate source for why these people are angry at you in the first place. Because they don't, in, in the same way that, uh, you know, people of a collectivist mindset don't see the difference between this, you know, this Israeli and that Israeli and the other Israeli. They also don't make a differentiation between this Westerner and that Westerner and the other Westerner. They just be like, oh, yeah, you're all part of this thing that's bombing my people, essentially. And then we're going to be so stupid to bring them here. So, yeah, I mean, I do, I, I really think that if you're going to ever break out of like kind of boomer talking points and the kind of same old neocon trap of, uh, you know, you have to break out of counter jihad as a frame because it can't, it doesn't lead anywhere. It leads, I mean, well, it does lead somewhere. It leads to Douglas Murray and um, what's her name? Uh, what's her name? Old, uh, and Tommy Robinson and, Who's that one who went on The Apprentice? Katie Hopkins and, you know, it leads to that. And in the end, it's impotent because it doesn't have its finger on the actual problem, the actual cause of these things. You understand? It's a second order effect. So. Um, yeah, it's not, not a lot, 
not a lot uh, else to say about it. Um, oh yeah, and the final uh, uh, the final stream here, or the final show, is a podcast called uh, it's called um, what's it called? Uh, it's called Our Interesting Times. Our Interesting Times. And um, I'm going to put it, uh, that's about a B as well, I would say. Um, now, there's a lot of interesting information on that show. They cover some things that aren't covered elsewhere. Um, there's a guy called Tim Kelly who does it. There's another regular guy on there called Joe something. I'm not exactly sure. The Now, now the trouble, the trouble is uh with the our interesting times coverage on this is that uh how can i put this they want to talk a lot about the freemasons on there and for whatever and again i mean it's the adam green thing again whenever people start talking about freemasonry and oh you know to really understand what's going on you have to go back to the 19th century and have a look at what Lord Palmerston was doing as a thirty as a thirty third uh, rank you know, Grand Master Freemason, you know, in eighteen fifty two. Yeah, I mean, all right, fine. Uh, I mean, I, I I don't know. I I have I kind of um, uh, there's just you know. I have limited uh, bandwidth with that sort of stuff, as I've mentioned before, because you then start asking questions and it's like, well, this doesn't make sense. Like the the framework where you're saying, well, actually it was just the, like it's this one group and they're kind of their way of thinking and their way of being. That kind of makes sense. Now I have to think, well, actually forget about all that because secretly it was British Freemasons behind all of this. So, oh, right, okay. So now I have to work out a framework where I've got like 33rd degree Mason, Lord Palmerston, and uh, Lord like Rothschild or whatever. And I, I don't know, my eyes glaze over. I can't, I, I've never been able to get into that stuff. Um, maybe it's my own failing, my own blind spot or whatever. But I just, uh, I just can't go with it. So uh, that's why it's a bit, I know it's a B because there's a lot of good info in there, despite that element in there. Um, and in fact, there are a few times where I'm like, you know, um, and there's one show that he does with E. Michael Jones, Tim Kelly does. And um, I think he got a much better show out of E. Michael Jones than this Catholic dude did here. Uh, um he, he Michael Jones was better on this podcast than he was on the one he highlighted there. So, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, I think that'll do. Um, I will, I will also say, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not been watching, uh, watching chat. Don't care. Uh, and, um, I'm not, uh, uh, I haven't seen. I haven't watched the X twenty two report on on this. Uh, I don't know what his uh, takes are. Um, I also, yeah. I mean, okay, Rotherham. I get it, right? Obviously, I'm not happy about what happened in Rotherham, and it's an absolute tragedy what's happened. And that is uh, that is obviously the worst excesses of political correctness ever seen. And you know, the complicity of the British state in that happening was an absolute disgrace. Obviously, obviously, that's, you know, it goes without saying, okay? But um, there is a limit. Why do you think it is that so many people who came into this upset about that end up pointing out the limits of counter-jihad? Why do you think it, I mean, if, why do you think so many people take that view? That's my question to you. Are they all mad? Do they all like suddenly like 
stop caring about girls being raped because I don't think they did. I don't think they did, you know. So then you have to start looking like, well, who facilitated this? How did that happen? Who pushed for the who pushed for those policies? What happened when people tried to do something about it? What happened to the whenever anybody tried to organize against it? Who were the specific individuals who, you know, moved as a phalanx against them? Was it always the was it Sadiq Khan and the Muslim Brotherhood every single time? Or was it some of the exact same people who were who were who were saying, oh, how did it get to this point? Jews feel unsafe on the streets now. Multiculturalism has failed, everybody. Or was it some of those people? So you have to look past the tier one sometimes to see what's really happening. Um, I should mention, by the way, that those people who did the Rotherham are nothing to do with. They are not there because of wars in the Middle East. I should mention that. Uh, they are there because of something called the Commonwealth Act that uh, was passed in the 60s. In fact, in tandem with the Immigration Act in, the, in America. Uh, can't remember the exact dates now. It was 64, I think, 65. Um but um, I think just after the war, there was something called the Commonwealth Act under the Attlee government, where they basically said, oh, anyone who was part of the empire can just like automatically come and move here, which is a stupid thing to do. And then, um, then they explicitly passed anti-discrimination, anti-racism laws in the 60s at the same time as civil rights. Uh, maybe one day I will do, um, I will do a stream on that but as with all things that happen you have to then look into who were the individual active activists involved which groups were involved who fund who funded this who wanted this within the labor party and within the tory party what happened to people who tried to do something try to speak out against it what happened to the good british patriots who died uh, or served in world war ii the, the, the guy like you know these guys who wrote these books uh these books i've been writing and they they made the kind of pro british empire league and all that what happened to anybody who tried to you know at, be be um uh, organized against any of these things happening who shouted them down where did the organization come from whether i'll be even able to do such a stream as that on youtube i don't know but these are the things you have to ask, right? These are the things you have to ask. So, you know, you can have a look at that book I've got here about the uh, decline and fall of the British Empire. What was the name of that book? Uh, I read a few, week, a few weeks ago. So, I mean, Pakistan, right. Let me just, let me just do a little bit of history for you, everybody. Right, you say Pakistan's not part of the Commonwealth. I'll just do a little history lesson for you. When India was under the British Empire, okay, and they then connived behind the scenes to prop up Gandhi to get the country off the books and to get the the kind of nationalist independence movement movement going. And you can look into that as well, by the way, and see who was behind that, which people, what their background was. Look them up on Wikipedia, how that came about. Always the same, all throughout history. Um, when uh, India got its independence, um, very, very quickly they discovered in fact, it was before. Uh, I think it was even before the independence. I think this was a still under the still like one of the last things the British did is they figured out that um, the Indians and the Muslims can't stand each other. The the Hindus and the Muslims to this day they hate each other. That's why um, there are so many like Indian Zio shills on Twitter because the Hindus just hate the Muslims. 
always have done, always will do. Um, and so they they had the partition, and you should read up about the creation of Pakistan. Uh, I think it was initially East and West Pakistan, and then uh, there was some, I can't remember the exact details, but there was some sort of war, and Bangladesh became Bangladesh at that point. Um, and it was one of the biggest uh, kind of exoduses, mass migrations of people in history when they created Pakistan. They created a new Muslim nation. Um, so there it is. So... There we are. All right, let's have a look. Uh, yeah, apparently uh, Apostolic Majesty has got a good stream on uh, on um, the creation of Pakistan, right? So when you say it's not part of the Commonwealth, I'm pretty sure that when they did that Commonwealth Act, anyone who was a subject under the original under the original British Empire uh, at the at the time that they wrote that rule would have been allowed. And, I, and I'm fairly certain that if you're a Pakistani, you could you could come over. That could that, that now that could be different now. Maybe that's changed. But at that time there was a huge influx of Indians and Pakistanis uh into the country in the sixties and the seventies. And I, I'm fairly sure under those that's the reason that there are so many of them here was was that Commonwealth Act. Um Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, it's, yeah, okay. So, so it's not true anymore. It's not true anymore. But it was at that time. Um, I don't know when that legislation changed. So there it is. Okay. Let us now have a look at some super chats. Uh, I'll have a look on entropy first. Takar says, are you surprised that Hamas doesn't appear to be catching much flack for their self-serving provocation of Israel's predictable retaliation? Um, well, I mean, they did. Initially, Hamas did catch a lot of flack, as you put it. Um, there was, uh, you know, every government in the world issued some sort of condemnation and the Israeli flag was... Uh, beamed over the White House and beamed over Downing Street and beamed over, uh, uh, you know, what's Canada's capital city called? I always forget, Canberra. And uh, probably every other capital in the world did the, some light display of the Israeli flag, right? In the West, not in the world, in the West. Um, the trouble is, is that uh, the retaliation by Israel has been huge. You know, let, let's say Hamas the Hamas attack killed 1,400 Israelis. I mean, how many Palestinians have the Israelis killed now? They're not all Hamas fighters. They're women and children. It's just normal civilians. And the trouble is, is that the Israelis do not make a distinction between Hamas and normal Palestinians. They say that every Palestinian child is a Hamas in waiting, right? Is Hamas in waiting. Basically, the Palestinians voted for Hamas. So there's no real difference between Hamas and the Palestinians. Now, how do I know this, right? How do I know this? Um... How, how do I know this? Uh... Oh, Canberra is the Aussies. It's Ottawa. Sorry about that. I always get confused with the. Uh... I always get confused between uh, Ottawa and Canberra because they're weird, right? You'd think, oh well, it'd be Toronto and Sydney, but they're not. They're these kind of weird. I think that was a design thing. They did it in America. They were like, in America, the capital of every state and the capital of every and the capital of you know like. Washington DC is designed as a political center. It's not like the bigger city. It's ne never the city you'd think it is, right? Um, and I think they did that by design in Canada and in Australia as well. Ottawa, sorry. Um, um, yeah, okay, let me carry on. Uh, yeah, how do I know 
that the Israelis don't make a distinction between Palestinians and Hamas. It's not just because Judith Butler told me. It's because I watched the same interviews on television as everybody else did of former Prime Minister, what was his name? Bennett, former Prime Minister Bennett, ranting and raving about how he's going to destroy Russia. Well, in that, in that rant, he explicitly said that every Palestinian child is Hamas in waiting. So there's no difference between them. He's the former prime minister. When I listen to the Israelis talk, they don't make a distinction between Hamas and Palestinians. That's how I know. And everybody else can see this, right? Everybody else can see this. So there comes a point where the, the response to the original attack, whatever sympathy was garnered for Israel, by those original attacks now pale in comparison to the to the retaliation which is far above and beyond what the original attacks justified in the first place and the 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 phrase i've seen in on bbc and on sky news and on mainstream media is this is collective responsibility you're trying to you're trying to basically kill like children for something that Hamas did. That, that, that's why. Um, Takar says, does recent media coverage take you uh, make you consider any revisions to your octopus model with the chest at the top? Uh, no, it does not. Because if you remember in that original talk, I drew a distinction between the neocons and the techno-globalists. And... Um, it's always been clear to me that the pro-Zionist voices uh, are centered in Washington and they are somewhat different from the um, the kind of financial globalist. I mean, if you notice, some of those guys have been a bit quiet, right? Like Bill Gates is not like rah, rah, Israel. You, you just sit this out. They're a rival castle. And that was part of my original analysis. And if you watch my original talk on it i was focusing on the financial bit not on the uh neocons who in my view um covid was the globalists on top ukraine and israel are the neocons back in the saddle and there's a kind of subtle vying for control between those things um and that so many avenues of the mainstream media are against Israel in this conflict or are soft key kind of low Palest pro Palestine uh, shows you actually the accuracy of what I was saying in the octopus model. I always said the the gay is not what people used to call the Zionist occupied government. Not the same thing. And I think that you can, the tensions between those two are on full display for everybody to see. And if I was to make a prediction, the, uh, the globalists, the techno globalists, will use this uh, um, conflict to further their ends, to increase United Nations power, to increase non governmental oversight of the United States government. And um, kind of tricky for us because it's like, well, who do you want to win that battle? The, the Zionists or the, the globalists? I, and in my neutral value-free analysis, I say the globalists will win in the long run and are winning heavily in the optics battle. Takar says, what is Glub Pasha's Saracen rank of Palestinians? Um, I will I will have to double check on where he places the Palestinians. I know they're low down though. The Palestinians are low down. And this is um now somebody in the chat saying you at the UN is coming to an end. That's possible. I I think that um I think the opposite. I think that all of us watching this will outlive the nation of Israel. That's my view. I, I don't think that the Israelis will uh, survive this. Um, and in fact, I, I had a look at the 
Israeli ambassador who was in the United Nations calling for the UN to um, for calling for the UN Secretary General to resign. He sounded like a raving lunatic, and he he did that in front of the entire world. And sooner or later, the fact that the Israelis seem like nutters is going to catch up with them, and that the American government, now weaker than it was in 2003, will, in the end, have to yield. And when it happens, probably we may see a p passing of the torch um, to China, who increasingly are becoming the mediators and the peacekeepers in this scenario. Um, I mean, it's very telling that if there was a proper peace negotiation between Ukraine and Russia, for example, it was the Chinese who would be the mediators. And increasingly, people are looking to China to be the kind of uh, the neutral party, the peacekeeper. That means they're the de facto superpower. And um, it's entirely possible that America will lose that position purely through uh, supporting Israel through their unwavering support of Israel. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I, I, My view, I mean, I wouldn't want to make a bet on this because obviously it's a, anything can happen. But at the moment, it looks like Israel is delegitimizing and um, may not be a nation in a few years' time. That's what that's... I mean, if I was an Israeli, what I would do right now is I would uh, um, uh, if I was an Israel, I mean Liam, you're saying that uh, EMJ's position has never changed. Theology isn't your thing. Stay in your lane. I mean, I'm not Catholic, dude. So I mean, I don't know what, what do you want me to say. I just like whenever he starts, you know, shilling for the Vatican, I just be like, yeah, okay. Now I have to ignore all of the shit Catholics have done in America since like, since like the turn of the century. Okay. I will just call out bullshit when I hear it. And EMJ turns a blind eye to that part of the Ellis Island coalition. It's just bullshit. And I'll call it out as bullshit. So, you know, I, I whenever anybody starts like kind of shilling for like an actual institution or an actual thing, they end up in my experience, um, aligning true things and i'm afraid emj does that for the pope okay um let me just carry on then uh with super chats um uh taka why do you think might is right is such a universally unacceptable messaging for the plebs why do rulers justify conquest in terms of irredentism or religious or human rights um well, really, might is right um, is a, is not a very good political formula. There usually needs to be uh, something that legitimizes power, right? It's the question of legitimacy. Um, and unfortunately for Israel, I feel like they are not acting like a legitimate government. They're acting like a government who cannot be trusted with uh, high-tech weapons or nuclear bombs. Um, and, and, and in fact, uh, I think that, uh, the longer that they, the longer that this goes on, the more the world will come together and be like, we can't have this effectively rogue nation trying to hold the rest of the world to ransom. Just, just, just can't do it. Too many billions of people's lives are at stake. So, um, yeah, uh, how it resolves, I don't know how it all resolves. I don't know, but, uh. If I was Israeli, what I would do pronto is get rid of Netanyahu. If they could replace Netanyahu and be like, right, that dude was a religious nutter. So we've got rid of him now. And now we've got someone who's just sensible. Right. Who talks like any other normal leader and doesn't like go on rants, quoting like ancient scripture to justify massacring children and um if they could say something like oh we've listened we've understood and we've heard you we're not going to do that anymore 
we're going to like, I don't know, we're going to set up a, a neutral administration to look after Gaza and the West Bank or whatever. And if they could do that, maybe Israel would survive into the kind of bright new future. Uh, the route they're on, I think that, um, I mean, it's basically make or break. And I, I just think the way things are going, it doesn't even matter if they win militarily. I think they're just done. I just think they're done. Because, I mean, if you look at the trajectory of where things are going, okay, and they're relying on essentially like boomer support in America, the boomers are going to die. The day of the pillow will come, right? And once they're gone, like, you know, Pedro in Texas, I'm not talking about Pedro Gonzalez, I'm talking about a generic Pedro in Texas, or, I don't know, Ali in Leicester, or whoever, they're not going to give a shit about any of this. If anything, they're going to be pro-Palestinian. If you look at the United Nations votes, they've even lost France. Even France have broken ranks on this already. Israel are down to literally about 10 allies in the entire world. And increasingly, it's basically just Britain and, Amer and America. And even the British support will start to waver as the reality of the fact that a lot of Muslims now live here. Keir Starmer, while this has been going on, has been facing a massive revolt within the labor ranks not just from muslims but from like left-wingers basically of all stripes who just like we're not going to go along with this um so i really do think that unless israel changes course and some finds a way of dumping netanyahu um i think he will lead them to ultimately israel no longer being a state i really do uh so and this is one of the problems in a way um with the israelis which is that they let emotions lead them a lot of the time which is strange because they're meant to be like high iq chess players or whatever but they never do that and um to me ever since the hamas attack happened israel has been like a poker player playing on tilt you know what that means playing on tilt they've been like saying stupid things doing stupid things you know that guy bennett who went on tv and vowed to destroy russia right when that happened the legendary mossad or whatever should have just been like dude you can never go on tv again put him in jail kidnap him get get just get rid of him issue a statement saying listen, Bennett does not speak for Israel. He's a fucking nutter. Okay? They didn't do that. Netanyahu didn't do that. Instead, he came out and made biblical speeches. It just, I mean, you have to face the reality. It's 2023. You just can't get away with it. And they won't. They, In the long run, I think they're done, honestly. So let's carry on. Um... I think the the uh, the kind of aura of invincibility around criticizing Israel, around you know their kind of super weapons that they had, the cultural, social, and political capital they had from Boomer Truth, from World War II, from the mid-century Germans, from the Holocaust, all of that is gone in the space of a few weeks because they've overplayed their hand they've overplayed it and they and they're doing it to people who increasingly don't care so all of these things mean that in the long run they may even get away with wiping out hamas and getting you know do it like carrying out this cleansing of gaza that we're seeing they may like get away with it in the short term but in the long term i think they're done i really do um I I, uh, I I I heard somewhere that eighty years is the there's never been like a like a Jewish state that's lasted longer than eighty years, 
And um, I thought, like, oh, that's interesting. But then I can't remember who it was. You mentioned, like, think of the USSR, if you see that as a Jewish state. <laughs> Didn't last more than 80 years. And um, Israel's coming up. I think it's 75 years right now. So, you know, if he can quote ancient scripture, maybe I can, and prophecies, maybe I can too. Um, Takar says, sorry, I meant Hamas catching flack from their own people. No Palestinian is asking, why did you provoke them? Oh, right. Okay. I mean, <laughs> the thing is, is that um, I think it's probably a bit difficult for Palestinians living in Gaza to sit down and have a debate about this because they're literally having their houses bombed. I mean, they've been shelled like continuously for three weeks now. So I think it's a bit difficult to start asking questions of the leadership when you're under siege, right? I mean, the the, uh, the reality has changed for them. Um, uh, the wider Arab world and the wider kind of Muslim world, I mean, I don't know because their debate shows happen in Arabic and so on. So I don't like, you know, I don't watch their TV and whatnot. Um, my dad occasionally watches Iranian stuff because he kind of keeps an eye on what's going on. So I'd like to know if those sorts of debates go on. Like, uh, I don't know. Because I don't like, I, you know, there's a limit to even the stuff that I can watch. And, you know, I've watched all these hundreds of streams. I'm going to start like watching Arabic TV to see what they're talking about. You know, um, You've got to understand, though, that in lots of that part of the world, they just see Israel as bad. Right. So that there, I think that a lot of people, and this is also a position that I've seen on the left, um, people like Judith Butler and so on articulate as well. They think that the Palestinians um, are just pure victims in this, right? They are the victims of like, they live in an open air prison and they are just mistreated by the Israelis routinely um, mistreated in a way that is analogous to how you'd imagine the Jews were treated by the mid-century Germans, right? This is this, these are kind of left-wing talking points. And what they would say is, is that um, <clears throat> they have no other hope. They have no voice. There is no way out for them. So in a way, the only way to give a voice to the voiceless is through something like the Hamas attack as a kind of cry for liberty or some, something, right? That's the sort of thing that you'll hear on Democracy Now!, for example, right? So possibly I'd imagine a lot of the Muslim world would agree with those sentiments, i.e. they wouldn't see, oh, my God, how could you do this, terrorism? They'd actually shed a tear of joy that... Um, the little guy was able to get one over on the big bully Israel. That's how I, I think that's how they process it. And um, I've actually seen a few clips of British uh, Muslims uh, have like articulating that sort of reaction. There was one uh, that people were dunking on the other day, you know, look at this girl, basically, uh, you know, she's like a teenager on a bus or whatever, doing a TikTok selfie thing you know, happy, kind of happy that uh, at what happened on October the 7th. Um, and I think that that's very common, that kind of frame, right? Um, so let's carry on <clears throat> with Super Chats. Uh, EC90 says, I don't know, but have you checked the Britisher recently? But I did. He is at the point of, if the defense of liberalism requires a Dresden, then so be it. And, of course, he thinks the far right are evil. Well, yeah. I mean, that's how liberalism always goes. Webster says, AA, I don't think this is a Fed post here, but as time moves on, it is vital for us British to learn self-defense, weapon handling, and home security prepping. Uh, I mean, especially if you live in a major city, you should probably have, uh, you know, uh, probably have something. I mean, I know many people who 
as a matter of course, like keep a baseball bat under their bed or whatever, just in case. Uh, yeah, I mean, do we got to? Everybody has to do what they need to do. Uh, Les Grossman says the best sort, this the the best source for me, is something websites, G Star R E websites, and not safe for work Reddit. Okay. EC90 says there will be no peace until the Lord returns. Uh, R. Philip says, please list in community notes. I can't read it. Um, okay, I mean, uh, uh, um, take a screen grab and try to decipher it, maybe. I don't know. Uh, Devastator says, hey, AA, Devastator is now devastator also can you do a stream on the who pandemic treaty going through the western governments right now there's a huge power grab implications from the treaties laid out um okay white talk says i hear the populist delusion was used as a textbook as a textbook where as a textbook for what it, uh, it is a textbook for my hit course foundations of politics which you can buy now at the academic agency friend lee says here's a tweet from the israeli pm in 2018 basically broadcasting the will to power rationale there's the tweet i don't i can't i cannot uh you can have a look at that uh in your own time i can't grab it um Malcolm Mackay says, give Adam and Sitch their own worse than F tier. Well, naturally, I don't watch Adam and Sitch. And, uh, you know, I never forget, never forgive. And, you know, I'll never forgive uh, that pair of clowns. Uh, cynical skeptic says, something I observed about Sargon of Akkad. He's always 10 years behind the curve at best. Great stream AA. Uh, well, I would say Sargon is uh, not 10 years behind the curve. He is, you know, being a friend of mine, I've talked to him, he's, you know, I would say he understands a lot more than you understand. Um, but uh, um, on this particular issue, I just feel that he may be making a strategic error, although I also understand that he needs to make shows every day and can't exactly um take like a it's it would be difficult for him i think to take an, a kind of openly uh anti-zionist uh take on his channel for obvious reasons um or um uh you know i think within the framework of what he's trying to do i understand what he's trying to do uh coastal reaction says can my twitter coastal folk be unblocked victim of mass uh blocking from months ago well what's your twitter handle coastal reaction post your twitter post your twitter uh reaction uh i, I mean i i have seven thousand people blocked on twitter so I, I won't ever be able to find it unless you give me a direct link um um edward collings said thank you for the war of 1812 discussion finished it this morning your insights with a great guest made for a very enjoyable stream all the best uh mutant 12 says mason pill is worse than a jq sorry mason pilled is worse than the jq as a schizotarium so there we go um well i mean you see the thing is is that those two things are not equal either um because there is a question in the second case and there is tangible things you can point to the mason stuff is like i, I don't know i just i have limited patience with it because it always goes back to oh look at this deal that was done in 18 in 1860 odd between lord rothschild and palmerston blah 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 i mean it's just fucking hell god's sake i mean I don't, I don't know. Uh, all right. 
let's uh, now, uh, I think we're pretty much done. I'll be back uh, later on with uh, Cigar Stream reading through Britain's Blunder. I'm starting through Britain's Blunder. Um, I actually pre I think I uh, pre-recorded it and my nose starts running. So I had to cut the stream short, uh, unfortunately, but uh, catch that later on. And uh, I will see you uh, later. Goodbye. Get out. What goes on in this town is none of your business. As long as I'm living here, it is. Then maybe you...